All right, so in this video, we're going to look at another couple of examples of political nationalism. Uh, and so in this video, we're going to look at the creation of Belgium and the very first attempt to unify Germany. So we'll start with Belgium. So if you remember, we've been talking about the territory that is Belgium for a while. Belgium was the Austrian Netherlands. And it was the, originally, it was the southern part of the Spanish Netherlands. It was what was left over when the United Provinces what we now know as the Netherlands, broke away from Spain. So we've been talking about this territory for a while, and it's always just kind of been sitting there right on the border with France. During the French Revolution, This territory was annexed into France. So it was a part of France during the pretty much the entirety of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic era. So this area was part of France. And during this period, they become aware of the ideas of nationalism, because that was a big part of the French Revolution. So nationalism becomes prevalent in what is going to become Belgium. Okay, so we finish with the French Revolution, we get rid of Napoleon, and we will jump ahead to the Congress of Vienna. So the Congress of Vienna is kind of our starting point for a lot of these events. So at the Congress of Vienna, had to decide what to do with the Austrian Netherlands. They didn't want the French to keep it, and the Austrians didn't want it back because it was really far removed from the rest of Austrian territory. So they didn't want it, and no one wanted to give it to the French, so they made a decision that it would be folded into a new thing called the Kingdom of the Netherlands. So basically they were going to put the United Provinces back with the Austrian Netherlands. So it would be the Kingdom of the Netherlands, which was pretty much the old Spanish Netherlands, basically the same borders, 
and it would be run by the new king of the Netherlands. Our old friend William. So he's William the first, King of the Netherlands. And that's what they decide. So this happens in 1815. Now this new kingdom of the Netherlands was not necessarily the best combination. These people were not alike. What used to be the Netherlands, and I'm going to call it the Netherlands just to keep it separate from Belgium. So the Netherlands were Dutch speaking, They were mostly Protestant, and they were industrialized. Belgium, the southern part, was mostly French-speaking. They are mostly Catholic, and they were more agrarian. Just say agricultural. Yeah. Okay, so it's okay that they're different. The problem was King William was Dutch and obviously favored his Dutch subjects. And when I say obviously, it was obvious to anybody who looked at it that he favored his Dutch subjects. So, like Charles, like Charles X, who favored the conservatives over the liberals, in 1830, King William is picking sides, and good kings don't pick sides. Good kings rule all of their subjects in the interest of the country. So it was pretty obvious that William favored his Dutch subjects over his Belgian subjects. And in 1830, we get a revolution. We get the Belgian Revolution. So the legend is a nationalistic opera triggered a spontaneous uprising. That's just not the case. It had been planned for a long time. Probably a couple of weeks in advance. but that shouldn't get in the way of a good story. It wasn't even a nationalistic opera about Belgium. It was a nationalistic opera about Italy. So I'm not sure why anybody would get all riled up over that, but that's, that's the legend. In actuality, the uprising had been planned for weeks. In response, 
So this is happening in August of 1830. In response, William sends an army into Belgium to stop this. But the French who border Belgium sent their army to their border to I guess scare the Dutch into going home. And after all the great powers met, to decide what to do. The best solution was Belgian independence. Metternich reluctantly agreed. Again, for Metternich, this was one of those best of bad situations. This was the best outcome that he could hope for given the circumstances. Because the other outcomes were continued fighting, which Metternich didn't want, or let the French have Belgium, which, again, Metternich didn't want. That would have made France too powerful. So the best solution was Belgian independence. So in December of 1830, we get the declaration of the Kingdom of Belgium And the son-in-law of the British king becomes King Leopold of the Belgians. Notice that it's not of Belgium, but of the Belgians kind of following the new pattern of monarchs being given power by the people. Now, one other little side note about this is that this happened right after, like literally weeks after Charles X was deposed and Louis Philippe becomes the new king of France. And everyone assumed that France was behind this.
until it became clear that Louis Philippe had no idea what was happening. Like, had the French really been behind this, they would have marched into Belgium as soon as it happened, but they didn't. So everybody kind of assumed that Louis Philippe was behind this, that it was another revolution just like the one that had toppled Charles, but it wasn't. It was completely unconnected, although they were definitely influenced. The Belgians were definitely influenced by what happened in France. There was no coordination between the French and the Belgians. It was just a coincidence. The other example of political nationalism that I want to talk about is kind of, we'll call it German pre-unification. And the idea here is what does nationalism look like in a really conservative environment? So nationalism is one of these forces that really can't be contained by anything. It can be harnessed and moved, but you can't bottle it up. And so there is going to be nationalism even in a place that is super conservative. And so now let's talk about Germany because Metternich tries to keep the German Confederation on lockdown with the Carlsbad decrees. But despite the Carlsbad decrees, nationalism keeps emerging. So one way that the nationalism emerges is through cultural means. Like politically, we couldn't unify, but we can unify culturally. And so one of the big projects of German cultural nationalism were the fairy tales of the Brothers Grimm. So these are your, you know, typical fairy tales, you know, your Snow Whites, your Cinderella's. And what they tried to do was collect folk tales from all the little Germanies as a means of culturally uniting them without the suspicions of Metternich. He's not really doing anything, they're not really doing anything politically. And there's nothing on the face of it that's wrong with collecting folktales. So this was more or less allowed. Another way that this was done was through economic means. And we've mentioned this before. We've talked about this sulfurine. So let's talk a little bit more about the sulfurine. So each 
little Germany. Had its own borders and tariffs, and it really hampered trade within the German Confederation. So the sulfurine was the idea of an economist named Friedrich List. And he basically argues for free trade. Argues for free trade between all the little Germanies. And this was done to keep up with British industrial growth. We're never going to catch up to the British if we trade amongst ourselves so poorly. So let's get rid of these trade barriers and maybe we can catch up to the British and eventually they will. But for right now, this is just an idea. And this is happening in the 1840s. Now, uh, Metternich hated this idea. and refused to allow Austria to join it. But since all the little Germanys were, I guess, technically independent, and they could follow their own laws, they all joined. And the biggest beneficiary of this is Prussia, because they were the biggest little Germany other than Austria. And they wanted to challenge Austria for German leadership. And that's essentially what's going to happen as we move into the later part of the 19th century, is that Prussia is going to overtake Austria because Austria is so conservative, they refuse to accept new ideas, whereas the Prussians, while they might be conservative, they're willing to take an opportunity when it appears to them. And this is an opportunity that appears to them. So Prussia, is one, going to get more money than Austria, and two, all the other little Germanies are going to now look at Prussia as a leader for the future, whereas Austria might have been a leader of the past. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, 
Our next set of videos are going to be about the Crimean War, which is a really big turning point in time period three and in the 19th century. So uh, our next set will be on the Crimean War. And until then, this is Mr. Nissen signing off.